Okay, welcome back. Habit six, synergize. So before we dive into habit six, okay, so habit five, just a little homework, um, little homework recap. Empathic listening, practice, listen with the intent to feel, to truly understand. Okay, that was part of your homework assignment, was practice empathic listening. Um, different kind of listening, obviously, than some of the other, you know, listening with the intent to reply. I mean, that, that's anything but empathic listening. You know, the, there was one comment that for whatever reason I didn't mention, and I wanted to highlight it and mention it today. Um, because I've, I've spent a lot of time working on habit five and I still don't claim to be, you know, great at it by any means. So it's even weird to run a hour long call last week and teach it when I don't feel like I'm an expert by any means in that subject, but it's something I've been working on. And the one spot, and I've been working on it for 20 years. I mean, this isn't like I just started a couple weeks ago. Um, the one thing I'll say, um, that I think is kind of powerful that I've just learned over the years as I'm trying to get a little bit better with this. I've gotten to the point that I'm, I'm confident that once people feel better, they'll do better. Like they'll self-correct. Like I know so many of us quote unquote teachers or leaders, we feel the need to be understood. I mean, isn't, isn't that what all teachers are trying to do? Hey, hey, listen, listen, pay attention. I'm the one with the knowledge. You're the student. So, you know, let, let me make sure that, that you understand me. And Stephen Covey gave that great example of the frustrated father. Like, I, you know, I don't under, understand my son. He doesn't listen. Uh, let me see if I got this right. But again, I just want to repeat that statement. I'm confident that if, once people feel better, like they, again, that, oxygen as Stephen Covey says they get that emotional psychological oxygen that's what he calls the you know the feeling of being understood that once people feel better they'll self-correct they'll do better I, I, I really do not all the time it's not 100% bulletproof but it's just somewhat of a rule of thumb that I've had over the years that I'm just I'm confident people will self-correct it's when people feel like not good that usually their performance will somewhat reflect that feeling, you know? So I, I think it's really important how people feel around us. Okay, so I wanna throw that little plug in for habit five, uh, such an important habit, you know? Uh, but here we are, you know, habits four, five, six, the public victories, you know, it feels like a long time ago we did habits one, two, and three, the private victories, but here we are now, number six, you know, synergize. So, my first exposure to synergy, okay, I'm from a small little town in Saskatchewan, Canada, Humboldt, Saskatchewan, Canada, very, very much a farming community. And I, and I don't remember the grade, I just remember it was elementary school. But uh, here we have a math teacher given some stuff that just didn't make some mathematical sense. One of them was, you know, a B, a bee is too heavy to fly. Mathematically, those little wings, that bee's got no business flying. If you recreated a bee in, in a mechanical terms, that thing wouldn't leave the ground. Oh, well, that's interesting. How do you explain that math? Here's another thing with math that really caught my attention as a youngster. That if you've got a horse pulling a thousand pounds, maximum capacity, think of a big Clydesdale horse, can pull a thousand pounds. You've got another horse, exact same kind of horse that too can pull a thousand pounds. Harness both those horses together and those horses together can pull 2,500 pounds. Like mathematically, if a horse is pulling a thousand, another horse can pull a thousand together, they should pull 2,000. I mean, you don't have to be a genius to add a thousand plus a thousand but he's like no this is just some of this unexplained math that somehow those two horses pull 2500 pounds they pull more weight as a team than they could ever do collectively individually i'm like huh 
That's interesting. I mean, that's just really interesting. One of those things I'll just never forget that I heard a very, very long time ago. You know, you can produce more. I mean, the lesson that I got, the, you can produce more from a team than you can produce individually together. Sounds like an oxymoron, individually together. You can produce more from a team than you can produce individually together. And then extrapolate that in the real world, if we can. I mean, isn't it true? Isn't it true that if you're a team builder, if you know how to get the maximum out of a team in any career path, you will make more money. You're worth more to every organization you ever work with if you're a multiplier than you will ever earn as a single producer. And I would challenge you to like give me the exception. I mean, I, I don't know of one exception of somebody who could make more money. I'm just talking real world dollars and cents here. Well, no, this guy would make more money as a real estate gunslinger, Jamie. The guy could make a quarter million bucks selling real estate as an individual salesperson. I'm saying, well, listen, if you really harness the laws of synergy here and you're great at, at, at training and getting producers on your team like that, wouldn't you make more than a quarter million bucks if you had 10 of those guys slinging real estate? It was just math. Multipliers are the highest paid people in the world. So again, synergy, again, that's interesting. You can produce more from a team. This is the whole public victory. We can do more as a team than you can produce individually together. You'll get this in the video. I mean, Stephen Covey does some math. He does his little short version of math. He says, you know, if you compromise, well, that, that math is one plus one equals 1.5 for those that compromise. If you have negative synergy, well, one plus one equals 0.5, it equals half. Well, that math kind of sucks. He says, however, if there's positive synergy, one plus one equals three. One plus one, as he says in the book, could be 1,600. Your idea plus my idea, we could come up with a third alternative and that could be better than anything we would have thought of on our own. I mean, I'm going to end up, you know, towards the end of this video, uh, I'm going to repeat this again, but here's like, here's the attitude. Here's, you know, straight out of the book. If a person of your intelligence and competence and commitment disagrees with me, then there must be something to your disagreement that I don't understand. And I need to understand it. You have a perspective, a perspective, a frame of reference that I need to look at. Again, last week I used the reference of like, shouldn't our politicians be doing this? I mean, right, if you've got a completely different perspective well, shouldn't I listen to that? Again, look at the qualifier, Stephen Covey puts it. A person of your intelligence, you're a smart guy. You're a smart girl. A person of your intelligence and competence. You've got a proven track record. You, you're, you, know, you, you do well. And your commitment. I mean, so I've got a lot of respect for you, and you disagree with my train of thought. I must understand. That's the spirit of synergy. And when people do that, when they do that together, man, I'm telling you, synergy is such a wonderful thing. And I'll give some real world examples of synergy happening in our business. And uh, it's, it's very motivating, extremely motivating. So that's where I want to start with you guys. I want to hop into a video now. I'm not sure if any of you had trouble watching video five on YouTube. Um, I think that one little video in the beginning that I showed I think it's owned by CBS or something like that. I saw that in certain regions, you can't watch that. So I'm putting all the videos on um, another platform too. I can't remember. So if you didn't get to see Habit 5 on video, uh, I've got it on another platform other than YouTube. So with that said, let me share.
and we're going to hop into a video. I know you love the music. I too love the music. <laughs> Habit six, synergize, in a sense, is the fruit of the spirit of win-win. Habit four, the spirit of seeking first to understand, then to be understood. Habit five, then what happens is a very powerful thing. When people begin to interact together genuinely and they're open to each other's influence, they begin to get new insight something happens to them both. It creates the possibility of third alternatives, not the either-or approach, not win-lose, lose-win, not compromise. Compromise is one plus one equals one and a half. Positive synergy is one plus one equals three. Negative synergy, one plus one equals one half. In other words, so much of the effort and energy is spent in the adversarialism, in conflict and defensive and protective communication that literally it just wastes the energy of the enterprise, of the marriage, of the family. Anyone who has experienced sustained conflict and contention, they know that very little productivity can come out. So just remember those definitions. Synergy is where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Synergy means you can literally produce something that neither of you could have produced before and even adding what each can produce separately. One plus one equaling two is not synergy. Negative synergy where there is internal contention and adversarialism produces less than even what one person can usually produce on their own. Because so much of the energy is wasted going in the wrong direction and is counterproductive. Now the traditional paradigm is one of compromise. That's literally where most people think we end up realistically. And it often is the case if you're in low trust cultures. But compromise isn't necessary if people will pay the price with habits four, five, and six. The key to habit six, synergize, in fact you could almost say the fundamental principle of six is to always value differences. It's not something you just accept that there are differences. It's not something that you tolerate. It's not something that is legislated through diversity programs. It is something that you celebrate. I mean genuinely, the strength lies in differences, not in similarities. However, if there is not a common purpose and a common set of principles, a buy-in to these universal principles we've been talking about, diversity, differences, can result in chaos and negative synergy. And it spawns prejudice, pre-judgment. And remember, prejudice is a protection against being vulnerable. If I get my security from my ability to manipulate people as things, and I can classify them, it protects me, see? I don't have to deal with people. I just deal with categories, and I have them labeled, and then I get into the self-fulfilling prophecy, and it is a seedbed to all kinds of other problems. That's why it requires this integrity of the first three habits. It requires the development of a common purpose, a common sense of meaning, a common sense of mission. What is it we're about? The moment you can achieve that, 
then run with differences in perceptions, in gifts, in talents. The more you have difference, the better. The capability of inventing new approaches, third alternatives, is increased exponentially because of differences. Strength literally lies in difference. These aren't just nice words to value differences. These are moral imperatives for those that really want to solve problems in entirely new ways. Go for synergy. So the moment someone disagrees with you, what do you say to them? Good. You see it differently. That's why I so value my wife's input, because I'll say, well, how do you see it? And she'll see it totally differently. But honestly, if you can learn to value differences and teach your children, the moment there's a difference, run with it. It's an advantage, not a disadvantage. I mean, if you're always around people that agree with you all the time, how do you possibly get smarter? Right, like, I mean, if your friends are always of the same, like we think the same, we have so much in common. Like I remember being an immature newlywed, having some struggles with my wife, Joanne. And I remember telling uh, a friend about some of the struggles and like, we're just, we're just different. And he said to me, he goes, well, didn't you marry her because she's different? Isn't that what was attractive to you? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Well, then why do you want her to be like you? I mean, God forbid she's like you. Like, imagine if the world is filled with nothing but you, what kind of world we'd be living in. I mean, you got to spice this sucker up. I mean, Abraham Lincoln used to do this all the time. He would bring, he would bring people with opposing beliefs into his cabinet. That's what Abraham Lincoln did. All right? He wouldn't just, okay, you all think like me? Great, you're my cabinet members. That's not how you make it great. You make it great by bringing in opposition. I thought that was interesting. I just want to highlight this again. We'll get back to that video. He says, always value differences. It's not something you just accept. Not something you just tolerate. Not something legislated through diversity programs. It's something you celebrate. He said, strength lies in differences, not in similarities. So I thought that was fantastic. Um, let's get back to the, where am I at? Screen share. Let's take an issue say, on the environment. That's a tender area for many people who have very strong feelings. How many here tend to be really strongly identified with kind of the purest approach to the protection and preservation of our environment, our water, our air, and so forth? How many feel like that purest approach goes simply too far and does not respect enough the necessity for the development and that it can be done in a way that will not violate, they would tend to be more on the other side of this continuum. Looks like about equal, doesn't it? I couldn't help when I, when I watched this think of, what's today's date? May 6th, 2020? It's May 6th. We're in our eighth week of a pandemic, okay? There's a couple different opposing views. And we're about to watch a nice little conversation happen between a, a pro-environmentalist and somebody who's you know, pro-business dealing with the environment. It'll, it'll be a great convo. I just wonder what it would look like if somebody who's like, the government's imposing on my freedom this is crazy. I, I, want, I don't want the government telling me what to do in one camp and somebody saying mass quarantine is the way to keep playing the game flat in the curve. I would love to see 
the two of them talk the way Stephen Covey is asking them to talk. Because the way you currently see them talk is, boy, do they ever fight and they name call and they say mean-spirited things and it's anything but synergy. It's polarizing. It's, it's divisive. But again, synergy, seeking first to understand all that stuff. It's like, again, watch this conversation unfold, but in the back of your mind, wonder what that picture would look like so the country can put some forward moving plans together on dealing with this curveball that we're all thrown at right now, right? So anyway, think about that as we're watching this video. Can we have a representative of, of the first one? Someone? Okay, would you come down for a moment? A representative of the second one? You have to be a person who really feels strong that the environmental thing has just simply gone way too far. It's out of whack. Someone? Anyone be a representative? Okay, would you come down, please? <laughs> you're? Diana. Diana? Mm -hmm. And you're? Carl. Carl. Good. Meet Diana. Hi, Diana. Hi, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, I'm going to ask them both that are you prepared to look for a solution that is better than the one you have in your head right now? Yes. Or the one that you have in your head? <laughs> You, okay, uh, yes. Are you? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I am. I just think they're trashing our planet. <laughs> yeah, you have strong feelings about that. Yeah, I mean, I do. Right, and that we're going to suffer irreparably. Of course, look at the rainforest. Look what they're doing. You should see our canyons. <laughs> I mean, again, he's picking a, a heated topic. I can't think of a more heated topic happening right now than do we continue mass quarantine or do we open up the country? I mean. Okay, so yeah, but I am open-minded. <laughs> <laughs> now, why does habit four precede habit five? Now look, they need to have a kind of common purpose, which is what? Synergy. The purpose is to find a solution that is better than the one she's going to recommend, and better than the one he believes in. Better. Now, I don't believe in the short period of time we're going to do this. We may be able to achieve it. Usually it takes about an hour to two. Now, are you prepared to go for a solution, not the one that you're thinking of in your mind, but one that is better than the one you're thinking of? Yes. What is the goal here? Yeah, they've got to think deeply win-win toward the purpose of synergy. Synergy is the fruit. So your purpose is to go for synergy. Now, unless they're anchored sufficiently inside themselves that the security lies primarily not in their positions and views, but in their integrity to principles, I really question whether people can practice habits four, five, and six. But this woman feels deep and strong. And we have to be careful that we don't judge her. See, to judge her because of her deep convictions would put us into kind of a win-lose attitude toward her. And also with him. Maybe he hasn't articulated the depth of his feeling to the rest of us as much, but they both have at least a tentative attitude toward win-win. Tentative. They don't know what it's going to be, and that usually happens. You don't know what's going to happen. A third mind has to be created, but I could guarantee you, once you get that, you're on your way to third alternatives. Now I'm going to intervene occasionally to kind of reinforce the habits, but you two go ahead and communicate for a minute. Okay. 
I believe that the forest, the valleys, everything should be kept pristine so that we can enjoy them that way. I don't think we need all this other stuff. Well, I can appreciate that point of view, but there's a certain amount of technology and progress we do need to make. But why? That's what they've said since the beginning of all time, and look what they've done. I understand that, but let me see if I can help us both understand this idea. Seek first to understand. Yeah. Synthetic clothes on. Yes. <laughs> How the yeah. shoes? The shoes, they're... they're well, Not any dead animals here? No, no, cows, no, no, no dead leather, animals. No, no leather? No, no dead animals. I like my leather shoes, but, <laughs> but let me just say... Yeah, so did the I, cow. I, <laughs> I appreciate that, that there has to be a reasonable amount of progress. Right. There has to be a reasonable amount of, of preservation. Right. Don't you think progress has gone too far, though? <laughs> Apparently you do. <laughs> Well, I don't know. This is just and most of the, most of the people. Cotton. That's right, but we make it out of petroleum. But I'm just suggesting that okay. there's a certain amount of progress, of technology, of production that we do need. Some say the production machine has gone too far, mm -hmm. that we're, we're spoiling the environment. I think we ought to be cautious. We ought to be reasonable. Do you but, agree? But has, isn't that what everyone said since the beginning of all time? Okay, I mean, now let me ask the two of you for a moment. What is Habit 5? Could you both restate Habit 5? Um, to, uh, to understand. To understand and be understood? To understand first, first or second? First. What first. has been our initial tendency here? To help her understand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, isn't that, isn't that the case? That's the case <laughs> with all debates, all arguments, for sure. <laughs> Can help her with habit five? <laughs> you need that, see? Thank you. I feel so much better. <laughs> well, why don't y'all understand? I mean, what is the problem here? No, I do understand. I do. Let's establish a ground rule. You cannot make your point until you restate the other's point to his or her satisfaction. Now I'm going to insist on that, and the other has to feel understood. <clears throat> you okay. Want me to restate his point? Yes. Go ahead and restate his point. Okay, so you believe that uh, with caution... And this is where you see the magic thing happening. ...progress should move forward and because it would Air. help, what, our economy? Is that what you're saying? Or tell me why you think we need to move forward. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, can't, you, you can't ask questions because, in a sense, your questions are rhetorical statements. Okay. You have to restate his point of view until he feels understood. And you can't do anything until that's been it's done. It's so hard, but I don't understand him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you believe that we should move forward with technology. In a cautious way. In a cautious way. Preserving the environment. Preserving the environment. Okay. It's a very difficult balance to get. When the demand is high for production, uh -huh. and maybe regulation is low mm -hmm. on the environment, mm -hmm. it, it's easy to let the bottom line push your production. Mm -hmm. And so, the uh, test of five is: it's difficult. Do you listen with the intent to reply or with the okay. intent to understand? So you're That's saying the thing to look for. That if we use proper balance and watch what we're producing that we can do this with wisdom and it won't affect the environment so badly that my little critters will die. <laughs> well, I hope so. I think so. And, and what about the environment? What about the environment? You know, do you feel like that she understands at least the first part of your feelings and your convictions? Partially, I, th I think... I don't know if she's mimicking yet or not. It, it's, I can find it's, out it's not that she agrees. <laughs> it's not that she agrees. That's not the issue. All right. She's not even taking a position. She's only seeking to understand. 
Do you feel like she has achieved that? At least, not the deepest understanding, but as much as you've kind of said to this point. You don't know. I you don't really know. question it. Let me ask you for, for a moment. As you are listening to him, uh -huh. are you preparing your reply? No. Are you judging what he's saying? I'm trying very hard to listen. You're really working hard. I can tell that. I'm trying hard to listen. Yeah. And I'm really trying hard to understand. You're really trying hard to because understand. two different things. Listening and understanding uh, are two different well, things. Well, you're listening for understanding, mm -hmm. not listening to reply, right. not listening I'm to listening judge. listening for understanding. You're listening for understanding, which means you have to get into his frame of reference, how he sees it, see? I know. Until he feels understood. What, first of all, do you notice between the spirit, between the two of you right now, compared to before? I'm listening. Right. Less adversarial. Isn't it a lot less adversarial? Mm -hmm. Right. That's true. And adversarialism is a seedbed to all kinds of other things. Mm -hmm. So you're avoiding that seedbed. Yeah. All right. Now, maybe on a 10-point scale, would you give her a 5? Yes. All right. What would you have given yourself? A one. A one? Well, that's interesting. That's the use of self-knowledge, see? That is so vital because when you're working with yourself, you're saying, wait a minute. Be patient. My day in court will come. My job now is to only understand I am not to judge. I am not to agree. I am not to disagree. I'm going to persist. I would give myself a one. My guess is, his five was generous. <laughs> but let's just persist for a moment and ask you to do the same thing, okay? To understand her. You try to go, if you can, for an eight or nine or ten. Okay. In other words, make her point as well as she made it and express the depth of her conviction. Go ahead. How bad is the environment? It's terrible. It's so bad. You should go up in the mountains and see it. It's sad what they're doing to the animals. It's terrible. Uh -huh. We can't do this. What are we leaving to our children? Okay. What is, what am I, what is my granddaughter going to have? So the future The future is grim. depends on us. I mean, look what we've done. Mm -hmm. It's our generation. We're the one that sophisticated everything. We're the one that we're dumping all that garbage in our oceans. So we're, we're the responsible group. Exactly. We're the ones that have to stop it and change the way we're looking at the environment. All right. Um, so we've got to do the intervention. We've, we've got to make the change. We've got to, we've got to turn it around. Will. The animals can't do it. I mean, <clears throat> seriously, who can do it for them? If we aren't economically responsible, who will be? Okay. Okay, now try to fully express as much as you can her whole expression that she's given from the beginning. And let's see if she feels understood. Okay, uh, the environment is going down in quality and uh, the animals are suffering, the landscape is suffering, it's changing its appearance. Um, the people in time will have a lower quality of life because the environment is getting worse and the children will inherit something of lesser quality than we have today. The animals um, are suffering because we're putting on them garbage and um, we're destroying their environment, their quality of life. Exactly. That's true. Okay, now, what would you give him on a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of his understanding of your point? Not that he's taken any position on it yet. I'd give him a 7 or an 8. 7 or an 8. What would you have given yourself? Um, probably not quite that high. Did you find yourself kind of preparing to reply a little? Waiting for, it's my turn a little later and therefore I'll kind of use this? Or were you genuinely empathic in understanding? Well, from, uh, from listening to what we've talked about here the last couple of days, I, I did want to hear what she had to say and to see if I could see the validity of her point. But see, then, in a sense, you're seeking to understand in order to judge later. 
Or to take a position later. Take a position later. What about the total openness of just seeking to understand with no intent to judge at all? Uh, my initial thought would be, where am I going then? Where, where is this going if it's not going someplace? I guess I seek no. a direction. What, what's our purpose? What is the goal we established? What's our habit to purpose? Is to find what? Compromise. Well, to, uh, to a compromise. Not a compromise. No. But, but that's what you really meant is synergy. Right. Right. Uh, a higher understanding and a solution that is better than the one you're recommending exactly. and better than the one. See, that's your habit too. Mm -hmm. That's really what you're going after. It's better. I'll tell you why. You both live on this earth. Your families live on this earth. The whole human race is interdependent. That's your point. The ecological like nature, which you also respect. Okay, now, what do the two of you sense just about the quality of the relationship with each other compared to the earlier interaction? I would at least sit down and talk to him. I can I live mean, in the same world she lives in. You have no choice. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, but I mean, I could live with the environmental movement. I can understand it. Do you find yourself changed at all because of your respect for the fact of his convictions and feelings on this issue? I didn't say if your total position has changed at all. Okay. But your perception of him. Yes, my perception of him. How about you? Has your perception of her changed because of this little interaction at all? I think I understand her position. I think what we should do in production is maybe have someone of the environment a part of the production process. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, when you did this little exercise here, or when you saw it done here, you noticed the real sincere effort of openness and wanting to be influenced and then of having influence and how synergy resulted. Mm -hmm. Well, I sense more of the spirit of reverence and respect than we saw earlier. Thank you both. You. Appreciate that. play we saw here, why is it that that works, that it produces something that is synergistic? And by the way, some of you may be wondering, well, does that mean I sell out of my principles and values? The opposite. You actualize your principles and values, and when you come up with the last half of Habit 5, then to be understood, you can fully articulate. But when you go into Habit 6, synergy, the dynamic interaction of those people start to create solutions that are so opposite sometimes than the original intention of one for the other. These may be just words to you until you experience it. You could hear this and still tonight get embroiled with your spouse in a fight or with your kids. You could leave this very assembly and have some negative interaction with someone and immediately seek first to be understood. The most dreaded thing to happen in a marriage or in a family is to destroy the ability to communicate synergistically and to solve problems. You see the world not as it is, but as you are. Most of us tend to think we see objectively Unaware, we're looking through our lens of experience, of conditioning, of scripting. We call that a paradigm, a pair of glasses, the frame of reference out of which you operate, the implicit assumptions you operate on. Now, the key to objectivity is to accept subjectivity is to be aware 
I do not see the world as it is. I see the world as I am. Therefore, if there is a difference, what? Someone else sees it differently based upon their experiences. I need their experience. Otherwise, I will suffer forever from an insufficiency of data. So this concept of valuing differences is just not a good idea. It's not just something that brings unity. It's something that creates, through a cooperative communication process, whole new options, new alternatives. And this idea of humility, of accepting your subjective involvement, is not just some nice principle. It is a reality that people see things differently. And you need access to that. And through the interaction, the spirit of win-win, habit four, the spirit of seeking first to understand, then to be understood, habit five, and as the people respectfully, empathically communicate with each other back and forth, something new happens. I mean, I maintain you can take any issue you want and create a third alternative. If people will practice habits four, five, and six, I am genuinely excited by this experience we just had because I see in the power of four, five, and six, the capability of solving any human problem. Wow. Wow. All right, I'm gonna, I'm curious. I'm only looking at uh, page one here. I'm going to give a political statement, and it may come across a little shocking. Is this guy here a Republican or a Democrat? You don't have to answer. I'm just like, give me a hand by yourself? signal. Just give me a hand signal. This isn't a, you know, it's testy waters. I'm about to give you something. I'm going to give you something risky here. Are you asking about yourself? If you're a Democrat, yeah, okay. I think you're a Republican, but you don't like Donald Trump. That's what I think. <laughs> I think you lean Republican, but you're open-minded to hear what the other people think. But definitely, especially when it comes to economics, for sure, conservative. Many cooch <laughs> All right, well, let me give you something that that's, is the spirit, really, of synergy. I think this is kind of interesting because years ago, like, you know, when I, when I moved to America, I'm like, what, you know, I didn't know much about Democrat, Republican, all this other stuff. So I was kind of curious. And I've heard really smart people on both sides say, you know, smart guy says a Democrat, smart guy says Republican. I'm like, I want to know more. I'm, I'm curious. I, I want to get into the voting thing. I need to know where, where I stand. What's interesting is, again, talk about synergy. Here, here's my stance. My color is purple. Purple? Oh, Jamie, what a cop out. No, I am a registered independent. And here's why. And it comes back to politics discussed 2,500 years ago. Plato said that if the government gets too big, it leads to a dictatorship. And if free enterprise gets too big, it also leads to dictatorship. Too far to the left, too far to the right, both end up in a dictatorship. So you really want to swing the pendulum back and forth to keep a nice democracy going. What an interesting perspective. I'm not saying my perspective is right, because I know some people would, I mean, actually just about everybody would disagree with me because usually people are camped on one of those two sides. But if, again, if you go too far to the right for too long, you need the government involved. If the government's getting too big, you need 
you know, you need to swing it back this way. So kind of an interesting synergistic perspective, whether it's right or wrong, that is a political point of view that I have that I, I thought I'd share because it, it, it really embodies that whole synergistic point of view. Um, you know what he said in the video, what is synergy? Simply defined, it means that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. One plus one equals three or more. I've already said this, the attitude. If a person of your intelligence, right? I know that Mehdi Kuchdaf guy is a smart guy. He and I had a religious debate. I remember this, Mehdi, you and I having a religious conversation. Um, Mehdi is a Muslim guy, I'm a Christian guy, and we both have strong convictions. It was, I mean, I would say, I remember that conversation clear as day. I think I even remember what we were eating. We were in Texas at probably Schlotsky's eating. And um, it was a synergistic conversation where two people can get along and two people can accept each other's points of views. And it's been a, a re very fond relationship. It wasn't each other trying to prove the other wrong. It was a seeking to understand and respecting each other. I want to share this. This is out of the book. Uh, I'm going to share screen again. I just happened to turn it into my own little chart. You know, habit six, synergies, synergize. Levels of communication. So trust and cooperation, okay? Trust and cooperation. Low trust environment. Low cooperation. You've got people that are defensive. Defensive. I just think about this. People that you're maybe getting to some political discussion with. If the trust is low, cooperation is low, it's either a win-lose or a lose-win conversation happening. Defensive. As Covey says, well, listen, we kind of get into this zone. Let's meet in the middle. And there's half trust, half cooperation. At least we're respectful. And there's compromise. And then really where the synergy kicks in is there's a high amount of trust there's a high amount of cooperation, and that's where you're finding the win-win. All right, so a couple of personal experiences. Again, I want to, uh, I'm going to share a screen here. This should be interesting. I want to, I want to use my Twitter account. I want to, I want to share with you my Twitter strategy. Anybody here have a Twitter strategy? Have you ever heard of anybody even say that? Twitter strategy, what the heck are you talking about? I use Twitter for, I'm not saying this is how it should be by any means. This is just me being a little crazy probably. But I use Twitter for two purposes. One of them is anytime I come across a really good quote, I just throw it up there. And anybody who like quote unquote would follow me would see that all I do is just quote everybody else. I'm never quoting myself. I mean, if I'm quoting myself, it'd be a lot of probably dumb comments coming out of my mouth. But I'll quote John Maxwell all day long. And I'll quote Stephen Covey all day long. And when one of my leaders says something real smart, I'm like, oh, I want to write that down. And when Gary says something real smart, I want to write that down. So that's one of the things I just broadcast what I think is some smart stuff. But my real intent with Twitter when it first came out, I mean, and you guys, again, things come out and you guys are, do you get on, do you get off, you know, snap off oh, Facebook, it's old, you know, it's for old people, whatever else. So you all have your thoughts on what you use for social media. But let me give you my synergistic approach with social media. I thought I'd share just for some giggles here for you guys. Uh, let me get out of this screen. Let's go to HEP's Twitter account. Ooh, we're inside HEP's Twitter account. All right, let's go to the profile. All right, I follow 25 people. You'll see my, my last actually tweet, because this is gonna be your homework assignment, uh, and I'll get to that later, but I tweeted right before this. But I follow 25 people, I think this is it. Now, why do you follow 25? Like, some people follow hundreds of people. I mean, I, I, I don't really understand that. Maybe there's something I'm missing. Obviously, there is something I'm missing, but I follow a really small group of people. Now, who do you follow, Hep? Well, I recently started following Gavin Newsom because I need 
to know what's going on in my state during the coronavirus. So I want to get rid of all the filters and all the um, press, if you will, and just read what he says. He says that Friday we're in phase two in California. Well, what does that mean? I don't know what that means, but I bet you he's going to tweet something tomorrow before Friday shows up. Tucker Carlson. I started following him a little bit. I've seen some of his stuff. And I'm like, oh, I like this guy. Now he's, he's a Fox guy. So he's a guy who's on the right. Okay, well, let's scroll down. I follow the left news, CNN, the left. Let's go back up. Stephen A. Smith, I think anything that comes out of his mouth regarding uh, sports is truth. I, I love this guy. Robert Kiyosaki, I've read all of his books, and I think he's an extremely smart guy when it comes to money. Megan Kelly, I've been a big fan of hers. Um, no matter what network she's with, I think she's great. I mean, who doesn't love The Rock? I always want to know what's going on with The Rock. I want to know what's going on with my buddy Jen Bricker. I love Jen Bricker. Connor McGregor, I'm curious. He's such a rebel. I always want to know what's on his mind. Gary V is the swearing version of John Maxwell for the most part. I mean, that's one way to put it. Mike Fabares is the smartest human being I know. He's the pastor of the church I go to. I love Pastor Mike. Patrick Bed David, my goodness. I think we're all huge fans of Patrick. I mean, love the content he's producing. Trevor Noah will give a left-wing perspective and a funny perspective of the news. I like Trevor Noah. Tommy will give the right perspective of the news. So I, I kind of like these two are the yin to each other's yang is kind of how I look at it. Tim Grover, I, you know, I trained Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade. I mean, I'll follow this guy all day long because he understands how to get peak performance out of people. Bill O'Reilly, I think Bill O'Reilly knows how to speak the truth. Richard Branson, you know, cutting edge futurist. Musk, I don't need to even give him an introduction. Business insider, President Barack Obama, President Donald Trump. Again, talk about the yin to each other's yang, right? Kobe, been following Kobe forever and will never stop following this, even though, you know, I don't need to go any further there. Conan O'Brien. Uh, just a funny guy. Tony Robbins, I've loved him since I was 19, and John Maxwell is a stud. I share that again just to, I mean, I use Twitter to somehow inject information into my mind. That's what I'm using Twitter for. There's the news. You can inject the news into your mind. And so I use it kind of as a news feed and I want to know both sides. I never want to just stop with like a left wing thought and just end it. I always want to know what the argument is. I never want to know the right side without knowing the left side first. Man, do I see that being rare today? It seems so rare. But somebody on the right just wants to bleep everything on the right, doesn't want to read anything on the left, and vice versa. But I think it, and I'm using politics just as the example of, we're, we're looking at a time that seems very unsynergistic. And you get synergistic really by, again, habits four, seeking win-win, and habit five, listening first. I mean, seek first to understand, then to be understood. And, and then you can come up with a third and even better alternative. Uh, so I want to use a couple real life scenarios um, that I've just seen with Synergy. I want to use two really uh, with Synergy. One of them, I've uh, piloted a bunch of new campaigns working in Sidcor. Um, probably the two most successful, not probably, I mean by far financially the two most successful have been Quill, which was piloted back in 2001, almost 20 years ago, and a little solar business we created in uh, 2012. And so what's interesting, and so those were the two big ones that really worked. I could give you a bunch of others that you know aren't around. What's interesting, anytime you do a pilot, anytime you're gonna start something new, a new enterprise, 
Are you going to recruit? I think you guys already know the answer. Is you're assembling a team. Are you looking to assemble a team of yes sirs and they take they're, these are great soldiers that take your orders and they run with it? I mean, no. I mean, again, again, you already know the answer because here we are in synergy. I mean, you know, Covey, like you celebrate differences. There is more power when you're different. There's way less power when you're the same. So you want to surround yourself with an amazing team. I want to take a little side note on that train of thought. Gary Paulson taught me something years ago when I first started working with Gary, probably in 2001. Um, he said, you know, the, the one common denominator of Fortune 500 CEOs, like, do I have your attention? The one common denominator of Fortune 500 CEOs. Curious what you guys are even thinking. What, what is, what's the one thing that the most influential people in business, maybe that's one way to put them, the most common thing, like, what do they have? They're fantastic recruiters. That's the one skill set they all have. If Ford Motor Company brings in a new CEO, everybody meet Mr. Bob. Well, you know, and I know that Bob ain't coming alone. Bob's a team builder that's coming with an army. When, so it's not like one position gets filled with a CEO. Dozens of positions get filled. That's how it works. And the CEO knows that, hey, I've got a couple key strengths and I got a lot of dysfunction. You'll find that the best leaders, the most mature leaders you find are very self-aware and honest with how bad they are at so much stuff. Whether you realize it or not, you suck with so much stuff. It seems the younger you are, the less you think you suck with certain things. The older you get, the more you realize, man, there's only a few things you're really good at. So of course you surround yourself with people that can fill those voids. <laughs> of course you surround yourself with people that fill those voids. So I thought that was interesting. So Gary was really encouraging me. He's like, Jamie, if you want to get good at this business, and he was new to the business, not like he understood, but he ran, understood our business, I should say. But he ran a very successful printing company and he's, he's very um, gifted just in business. You must get great at recruiting and you've got to know how to put people around you that aren't just like you. If you're limiting yourself to, I mean, when I think back to my early career, I could recruit guys like me. So what you're saying, they've got to be men. They're guys. You work good with guys because they're guys. You can relate to a guy. Oh, guys that like sports. Okay, you relate to guys that like sports. Okay, guys that like sports and go to pubs and drink beer. Okay, so I'm zeroing in on that demographic and I'm blowing it with everybody else. I mean, what kind of recruiter are you if you can only recruit you? I mean, if you can get good and, and you can understand women, Jamie, you'll open yourself up to 50% of the 51% uh, of the world population. Like, again, synergy, like you celebrate differences. So it's interesting, again, when you're putting together a Navy SEAL 6 team, I've always kind of called them that, you're the Navy SEAL team going to start a pilot. I want as much diversity as I can find. When I started the solar pilot, I brought on a residential expert. I brought on a high-end B2B sales expert. I brought on a guy who's got an engineering background. I brought on a guy who's just all about green energy and just loved solar and everything about the sun. Couldn't have been a more diverse group of people. Uh, and and a, um, a strong, gifted sales female. Strong. That had strong personality wasn't going to take crap from any guy. She, was, you know, she ran it for it was what it felt like. She's the boss. It was perfect. 
It was exactly what the doctor ordered. They didn't get along all the time. I mean, I mean let me reword that. They argued all the time because they all thought they were the smartest person in the room. And this happens on every pilot that we do. Like, I got a strong opinion. Listen, I'm the number one stud on at and All you guys be quiet. I know what I'm talking about. No, you just have one perspective and we all want to hear. And this other person has a perspective and we all want to hear. And what's interesting, if everybody's willing to hear all these smart, gifted people together, you can come up with some unbelievable third alternatives. And we created a model where there were setters and closers. People got onboarded as setters, moved into closer role, then, uh, then ownership roles. It was amazing. Synergy. The world of the coronavirus stuff. Apparently, who would have thought we can actually build crews of guys that can sell over the phone? I didn't know we could do that. But that takes some synergy that takes people talking, that takes people listening to each other and coming up with really good ideas and coming up with new models. So that's one real life example I wanted to give you guys. The other was this. Um, as a newer owner in the business in 2001-ish, let's just use that era, um, you know, I'm the owner was my attitude. I'm the owner. I'm the teacher. I'm the most experienced. And so I make the decisions. I need to decide strategy. I need to decide um, what the themes are going to be for the next week, this and that. And so as I read this book, as I studied this book, I'm like, huh. I mean, again, interdependency is the goal not independency. Okay, Jamie, congratulations, you're independent. You can be an independent uh, corporate licensee, even those are the terms we call owner. You're independent, but the goal is to be interdependent. It's a we game, not a me game. So I started, I you know, started working on, okay, you know what? I'm gonna bring my core leaders in on a Friday to plan the whole business on a weekly basis. And I'm just gonna be one of several voices. I'm not gonna be the dominant voice. I'm just one. Almost like introducing a board of directors. It's not like I legally have a board of directors for the business, but that concept of why don't you bring on a governing body to make the decisions for the whole business rather than you just doing it by yourself. It's a lot of work when you do it by yourself. And after listening to the Stephen Covey guy, none of us are smarter than all of us. It's a good quote to remember for synergy. None of us is smarter than all of us. If you think you're the smartest person on Zoom here, and maybe you are, you're not smarter than all of us, because you're already one of the many members on this. So how can you be smarter than all of us? It's impossible. So those Fridays, we started planning team nights together. We started planning sales training together. We started planning leadership development together, book clubs, events, travel, themes. I mean, I, I couldn't run a business any different today. I mean, I, now they're a crutch to me. Like, I need them in the development and decision-making of my company because I, I, their ideas are so much better than mine, I've learned. Or at least our ideas are so much better than mine. And I just wanted to throw this plug out there to my fellow consultants. Um, I mean, look at the synergy during the coronavirus. It's unbelievable. Look what Ed Cunliffe is doing on his daily Zoom. I don't even know what to call it. It doesn't even, it should have a different word for what he's bringing to the table. And it's a gift of Ed's. And he's a good interviewer. And he's a networker. He's a relationship guy. So. Guys like me are piggybacking on him. 
Like, thank you, Ed. Thank you, Sebastian Angus. Thank you, Adam Dorfman, on your YouTube channel now. Thank you, Joe Nolan, for writing your book and teaching us the, the eight weeks of greatness. And the list goes on. I mean, look at all the consultants joining various calls and contributing their thought process on things. Man, have, I mean, the word, it's not quite synergy. It's not the word synergy. I'll use the word leverage. We've been leveraging on each other, and it's been dynamic. I'd say we're at a better spot than we've ever been based on synergy, based on leveraging each other, based on using each other's strengths as a talent pool. Why would I ever run another opportunity meeting again when I could get Ed Cunliffe to run it on a video he made, and he does it 10 times better than me? Like, I mean, synergy. None of us is smarter than all of us. All right, so let me give you your homework assignment for next week. Okay, it's been almost 70 minutes that we've been talking here. Um, homework assignment, next week is the last one. Okay, but here's your unique homework assignment. First of all, you gotta read Habit 7. You already figured that part out. Like you gotta read the book before the call. Okay, so you gotta read Habit 7. You also have to watch the video of habit seven. And where did I post that again? On my Twitter feed, that's right. I'm easy to find on Twitter. I'm not asking you guys to follow me. I'm just asking you to get the video there. Um, uh, Jamie, my name is spelled like Jaime, J-A-I-M-E underscore Hep. I mean, just put Jamie Hep in. I think I'm the only one on the planet with that name. So I'm good. I'm not, uh, what, Bob? Smith and whatever common name is, I'm easy to find. It's that video, the um, Habit 7 video is over an hour and a half long. It's no joke, it's, it's a long one. I think it's, uh, I wanna say it's like 92 minutes. Okay, so I posted that up there, click on it, get a bucket of popcorn. You're, we're not watching a video together next week, okay? So your homework assignment is, actually, we're not watching that video together next week. Um, not the whole video, at least. So watch that video, read the book. And then this week, since next week's our last week, any questions you have, I want you to email them to me. Okay? Do it way before Wednesday. If you send it Wednesday, I'm not going to look at it. You haven't given me time to prepare. So you got to send it, you know, by Tuesday at the latest. My email address, again, I'm pretty easy to find. Jamie, like Jaime, J-A-I-M-E, hep, H-E-P-P, -P, at gmail.com. Even if you spell Jamie wrong, it still goes to me. I got that one too, so. Okay, so I got them both. So anyway, Try not to misspell it, but if you do, you're forgiven. I'll still get your email, all right? Um, so send me your question on the seven habits in general. It doesn't have to be on renewal. It doesn't have to be on habit seven, you know, sharpen the saw. Just, again, questions on the seven habits. I know each week has been slightly different than the week before. Being proactive is where we started. Okay, here we go. We're in the start of this pandemic. Habit two, extremely thoughtful, like, oh, my goodness, it's a lifelong homework assignment he's asking me for. Yep. Habit three should be coming into focus big time now because we're all getting ready to go back to work. So you need a good habit three or you're, you're, you're going to be in trouble coming out of the gates in this race. You need a really good habit three. You're building crews. You need a killer habit four. Win-win. We all need to get educated on habit five because none of us have been formally educated there. And now synergy and sharpen the saw. It's just so much unbelievable content. I hope you guys will spend the money and take the time to go to franklincovey.com, get trained in this stuff. It is so good. Um, I mean, I, just by going through this exercise myself, I want to go through another course again. I mean, I learn something every time going through this. 
So, you know, hopefully this stuff, I mean, I'll, I'll throw this plug at you guys too. Vera, every year when January 1st rolls around, the first book she reads every year is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. You think she already knows this stuff. Why is she doing it again? You might even have a question for Vera. Send me a question you want Vera to answer, and I'll, I'll throw her the question, and I'll maybe get her on the call, because Vera's, Vera's got game in The Seven Habits. But anything with The Seven Habits, you guys, any questions you have, shoot me the email. I'll do my best next week to cover Habit 7 and go through the questions here with you guys, and then that's a wrap. And then the rest is on you to be wildly successful, or as Covey would say, you know, wildly effective. Effectiveness. That's the seven habits. So thanks for being on the call today, you guys. Hope all is well. Stay strong. And I'll talk to you guys all soon. Thanks, Jamie.